Well, good morning again. We're going to begin a new series of sermons today that will take place over the next four weeks or so, and we're calling it very simply Equip, and that's about essentials for living the Christian life. And uh, to start off the series, I want to tell you a story about something that happened to me uh, 20 years, 25 years ago or so. I was a uh, junior in college. I was living on a dorm at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. I went to Bible college there, and I uh, really began my ministry studies there. But I lived on dorm number 22 on the second floor, and uh, our, our dorm had 60 young men that lived there, and there were 10 of us that were on like a sort of like a dorm leadership team. And uh, we were going to go on this little retreat to get the, uh, the year going well. And uh, so I went with a team of guys, and we went camping somewhere in Virginia. I have no clue where we were. Uh, I remember we did some hiking, and we, went, we had a campfire, that sort of thing. And it came time to go to bed. And uh, I had, I'd had a, a good uh, camping trip so far. But when we went to bed, I was in a tent with this other guy, another Georgia guy that I was friends with. He was from the Watkinsville, Georgia area. And uh, we were laying there in our tent, and as the night went farther and farther along, it got colder and colder. You know, I'm from South Georgia. It just doesn't really ever get that cold around here. And uh, it wasn't long, and I was laying there in the tent, and I was freezing. I mean, like the coldest I had ever been. Like, I didn't know you could get that cold, and your body could feel that way. And so I look over at him, and he's got this really nice, you know, expensive sleeping bag that's like made for camping in the cold. And uh, I've got this little comforter I bought at Walmart for my dorm room, you know, my little twin bunk bed that I had in the dorm there. And so, you know, I got to thinking, I said, I don't know how much I can take this, uh, how much longer I can take this. And so sure enough, in the middle of the night, it was like two in the morning, uh, my body just told my brain what to do. I got up, I grabbed my little blanket, and I went and got in my car, and I drove two hours back to campus in the middle of the night. And I said, I'm not doing this anymore. And uh, it wasn't that I, you know, wasn't a part of the leadership team. I was. It wasn't that I didn't deserve to be there with that group, you know, getting ready for the year. All of that was true about me, but uh, I was not equipped to camp out in really cold conditions like that. And as a result, I suffered and I quit. I gave up and went back to the dorm. And uh, I share that story with you because I think that we have a lot of Christian men and women who they know the Lord, right? They, They deserve a place at that table, so to speak. They know Jesus Christ, they're saved, and yet... I I think maybe we don't have the equipment that we need to live the Christian life really well. Um, God's Word tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that you can build the church up. And so that's, that's part of the job of a church together is to equip ourselves. Give us the equipment needed so that when the conditions get difficult... You know, we're not freezing to death and we pack up and go home. Matter of fact, the guy that was in the tent with me at one point, and this was probably around the point where I gave up, he looked over at me and he said, man, I'm so warm, I'm sweating over here Uh, because he had that really high dollar uh, sleeping bag. So I share that with you because over the next four weeks, we're going to look at uh, some different topics uh, under this same banner, the banner of equipping our people to do the work that Jesus has called us to do. I want to tell you, though, that these sermons are really just an introduction and and a promotional spot for a ministry that we're going to be starting very soon called Equip. Uh, it's, It's a process that we want our members to go through. If you want to serve in any leadership position in our church, our hope is that in the future all of our leaders will go through this process. And so I'm really just scratching the surface, touching on some of these important topics to equip you to live the Christian life well. So we'll say more about that leadership process and the class that we'll develop out of it. I just simply want to introduce you to those uh, ideas, and I really hope, as a part of your worship service today, that this equipping will encourage your soul to help you walk with Jesus today, uh, this very week. And so if you have a Bible, I want to share with you uh, a a sermon that I've titled, Life Made New. Okay, so you're a Christian. What do you do now? What are the things we need to know to equip us well to serve Jesus today? So I want to share with you from Ephesians 2, and we'll actually read a couple verses in Ephesians 3 also, um, that uh, will, will, will be some realities that are true about us as Christians that I think will help you uh, when uh, the night gets cold and you're shivering and you're tempted to quit. They'll help you to hang on. So turn there with me to Ephesians 2. And let me share these three realities with you. Number one, you are saved by grace. And that is a really important word, the word grace. 
Saved by grace. Not by works, but by grace. Now, if you're familiar with the Christianese language at all, you are very comfortable with the word grace. But I think many of us leave grace way back there at our baptism and we walk on without it. But that's some important equipment we need if we're going to serve the Lord well. We need always to remember we're saved, we're kept saved, we're being saved, and when our final day on this earth comes and Jesus delivers us into His kingdom in heaven, we will ultimately be saved. All of it is by this, grace. Grace means gift, and it stands totally in opposition to any concept of having earned that status or that relationship with God. We are saved by grace. Look at me at Ephesians 2, and I'll read verse 8. And nine, you can see so clearly this concept of salvation by God's grace. The Bible says there, you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's like the Apostle Paul really anticipated that, you know, we as believers, we would often, we would be tempted to stray away from this. He says, no, no, you're saved by grace. This is not from yourselves. It's God's gift. He reiterates in verse 9, not from works so that no one can boast. What's it mean that we're saved by grace? Here's what it means. It means that we are totally unworthy of God's righteousness and salvation and at the same time completely loved in Jesus Christ. It is a love, it is a forgiveness we did not earn, nor could we ever earn it. But because God is so good, so big-hearted towards us, He offers us this free gift of salvation. So what does that mean for you? How does that equip you to serve God well, especially on those cold winter nights, so to speak, when you're going to be tempted uh, to pack up and drive back to campus like I was, right? So here's a few things that that really means for you. Number one, you should be humble before God and always. And when I say humble, I don't mean overly modest I don't mean bashful. I don't mean when someone calls your name that you should just sort of tuck inwardly and say, oh, well, I'm humble. I don't talk to people a whole lot. I don't want to promote myself. When I say humble, here's what I mean. What you have when you have a relationship with Jesus is not based on what you do. It's based on what Christ has done. And because of that, there's no room for boasting. There's really no room for discouragement. Okay? In the Christian life, when we do well, we're real tempted to become like uh, the rabbit in that old fable, the tortoise and the hare, right? Uh, the rabbit was, was so good, he was so fast, that he was just proud. And he thought, you know, I can just take a break. I, I've been so good for so long, I can just relax. But, but uh, in our walk with Jesus Christ, it's not how fast we run. It's how good Jesus is. And that should cause us to be humble. When God does the work, there's not any room for human pride. And the fact that we're saved by grace always ought to remind us to be humble before God and before other people. Here's what we remember about our standing with Jesus Christ. Okay, It wasn't me. It was God. God did the work. My standing in Christ is not about how well I can behave, how many devotions I can read, how many volunteer opportunities I can sign up for. Those, those things are all wonderful and good as God leads you to do them, as you have time to do them and do your other responsibilities that you've got to take care of. Ultimately, though, what we must remember is we're saved by grace, not by our own merit. Grace means gift. And it's the kind of gift that totally catches you off guard and surprises you when you don't feel worthy and Jesus comes up alongside you and says, yes, but I love you anyways. That's grace. Uh, the, the Protestant reformer of you know, 500 years ago, Martin Luther, here's what he said about grace and the effect it should have on the human soul. He said a man cannot be thoroughly humbled until he realizes that his salvation is utterly beyond 
his own powers or efforts or will or works. As long as a man is persuaded that he can make even the smallest contribution to his salvation, he remains self-confident and it so is not humbled before God. And so Luther would go on to say, these truths are published for the sake of God's people so that they may be humbled and so saved. The rest of men resist this humiliation. Indeed, they condemn the teaching of self-despair. Watch this. Because they want a little something left, they can do for themselves. I, I believe with all my heart, that Christians should do good works. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But hear me well. Your standing before God has everything to do with who Jesus is and what Jesus has done on your behalf. And in that sense, essentially has nothing to do with your good works. None of our good works would ever be enough and none of our sins are so bad that Jesus can't pay for them. And this should make us humble. There's another thing it should do for us, all right? It should humble us. It should also make us hopeful, right? Because our, our walk with Christ is not based on our performance, but great, based on Christ's faithfulness, His goodness, it means that there's always hope for you. Whether, whether it's you and, man, you're just... Your walk with Christ is really bad lately. Like you've, you've not been committed. You've not been faithful. You've been really selfish. You've been mean to other people. You say, there's no hope for me. Yeah, but remember this. It's not about you. The gospel message is a message about Christ and what He did for you. And that ought to give you hope. When salvation is a gift, it is neither earned or unearned on your part. It is God's doing. And because it's grace, no one is too far gone. No lost person is any more or less lost than any other lost person. And no saved person is more or less saved than any other saved person. Because it ain't about the persons. It's about Jesus Christ. You didn't do anything to earn your salvation. Christ did it. You can't do anything to lose your salvation because Christ keeps it. The same grace that saves you is free, total, and effective. It's the same grace that keeps you, that guards you, that preserves you. And it is free and total and effective. Let me tell you a story that I heard another preacher say a few years ago. A very well-known preacher based out of Cleveland, Ohio. He was preaching a sermon on what we know as the thief on the cross. There's a story that, that uh, is in Luke's Gospel where um, Jesus is, is there on the cross in the act of being executed. It was not an immediate execution, but they would be nailed there on that piece of wood and, and they would hang for a few hours before ultimately they would succumb and they would die. And so Jesus is there hanging on the cross and beside Him is a criminal, a thief, who also had uh, been sentenced to capital punishment there on a cross. And this thief looks over at Jesus, and in that moment, he's visited by the grace and the power of God. Now this thief, he's got no time to go down to the church and get baptized. He's got no time to go out into the community to repair his reputation or to restore things that he had stolen. None of that. The only thing he has time for is to look to Jesus and he sees a Savior who loves him and he says to Jesus, there on the cross beside him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. And he expressed his faith in Christ. And Christ looked at him and said, Today, you will be with me in paradise. That thief understood what we need to understand. We're saved by grace. Now, I mentioned that, that preacher to you from Ohio. He, he told that story and did a little bit of imagineering. He said, you know, I imagine that the thief on the cross, when he did die, he, got, he gets to heaven and there he is at the pearly gates and some, you know, um, angelic administrative assistant is there to receive the, those that had just died. And they say, all right, sir, uh, we see you're here to enter heaven. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the doctrine of justification by faith? And the thief goes, I've never heard of it. 
And they say, okay, well, um, can, can you share with us your record of attendance at, at, at church? Surely you were faithful to meet in the synagogue every week and worship alongside God's people. He says, no, no, I never went. And they say, well, what in the world makes you think you can, you can come into heaven? And he says, I don't know. I just know the man on the middle cross told me I could get in. And friends, that's all it takes. Jesus is the reason any of us will see a heaven. It is not your good works. It is not my good works. I don't, I don't mean to, um, to speak ill of good works. In fact, our whole entire next point will be about the importance of good works. But in your walk with Jesus Christ, here's a piece of equipment you always need to take with you. You are saved by grace and grace alone. That should, that should keep you humble. It should keep you hopeful. It, sh it should also make you helpful. That's the other, other response we should have to grace, which is to say, listen, man, God's been so good to me. I need to be good to other people. Not to earn God's goodness. I've already got it. But just because, man, it's the right thing to do. When God's poured His love out on you, you want to share that love with other people. It's kind of like, um, you know, there, a few years ago I was in a, a drive through at McDonald's. It, it was breakfast time, and um, I get up to the window to pay, and uh, the worker there at the window says, Sir, it's, it's your lucky day. The car in front of you paid for your meal. And, uh, I, you know, I thought to myself in that moment, well, I wish Lauren and the kids were with me. <laughs> we'd have we'd got, you know, got a much bigger deal out of this. It was just me. But, you know, when, when that happens, you're, there's some people that will tell you you're supposed to pay it forward, right? Somebody did a good deed for you, so you should pay for the car behind you. And I'm just being honest. I, I remembered that, and I looked in my rear view to see how many people were in the car behind me. There's a big difference between, you know, just buying somebody's cup of coffee and, you know, like a, a family of uh, six or something. Because we've been saved by grace, really, really, we should be humble before God. There's no room for pride. And um, we should be hopeful. No one is too far gone. That includes you. And we should be helpful to other people. Let me share with you a second reality that, that bears out of this same passage. And again, this is kind of like a sleeping bag that, that's built for cold weather. It's equipment you need for when the Christian walk gets difficult. Second truth you are not only saved by grace, you are set apart for good works. Right? Well, we, we just spent the last 10 minutes saying good works don't save you. Now I want to say, yeah, but save people do good works. Our good works don't earn credit with God. All the credit's been earned by Jesus Christ. But our good works do give evidence that we, in fact, have met Jesus and that He's made that difference in our lives that the Bible says um, that He'll make. So we're, we're in Ephesians 2. Notice with me verse number 10, okay? Following immediately on, on the, the heels of these important verses about grace, right? And not your own doing, but grace. The Apostle Paul says in verse 10, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. So let me just say this. When you get saved, you're not just supposed to get saved and then go sit down. You're supposed to get saved and stand out. You're not saved by your good works. You are saved for good works. They don't earn salvation. They do give evidence of salvation. And um, that's what Jesus made us for. So here in Ephesians 2.10, I just want to make a few comments about good works. And my, my hope is that you'll be encouraged by these things. All right? I never want you to leave one of our worship services feeling beat up and worse than when you walked in. Okay? When we encounter the grace of God and His Word, especially if you're here and you're a believer, right? this should serve or minister to our hearts. Let me say a few comments about good works. Number one, your good works make God smile. If you could picture, if you could picture a parent or a grandparent with their young children, and, and they just have this moment of rest. I know those are hard to come by if you have little kids. But this moment of rest and you're watching your kids and they do something that makes you proud. And you think, well, well golly, I guess some of this parenting thing might be working after all, you know? 
And it just brings the most natural, heartfelt smile to your face. When Jesus works in your heart and you begin to do good works of faith, serving people well, right? Being selfless rather than selfish, gaining victory over, over sin and temptation in your life. When those good works begin to manifest themselves in your, li- in your lives, Jesus smiles and it makes him happy. We see that in the word there in verse number 10, workmanship, right? We're saved by grace. We are. Verse 10 says, his workmanship. There, there's some modern paraphrases that use the word masterpiece right there. God made us to show off to the world how good He is in saving people and making a difference in their lives. You know, I remember a few months ago, our church hosted a, um, um, an antique car show out, out behind the church in our parking lot, and especially that big grassy lot there on the other side of uh, Richland Avenue. And uh, there was a couple hundred cars there. I don't know anything about cars, okay? But I know a cool car when I see one, all right? So I took a couple of my kids, and we went and walked through the cars and just looked at them. They had tons of questions about the cars. I did not have very many answers, but we enjoyed it just the same. My favorite part uh, of the car show was there was a couple in the back, and they had this awesome car that was restored. I mean, it just looked beautiful. It was really old. And out in front on this little podium was a photo album. And there in the photo album, right at the start, you could see where they had went out into, you know, some dude's backyard and bought this car. And it was a piece of junk when they bought it. It was all rusted out. There were no wheels on it. It didn't work. At, but, but they saw what it could be. And so with each turn of the page of that photo album, they had a record of all the work of restoration that they did on that car. And so you see up here, you see where they cut out the old seats and put in new seats. And then you see where they put nice leather upholstery on the seats. You see where they fixed this, you know, the back part of the car around where the wheel goes. And, and they made it look really nice. And you get to the end of the photo album, and the car on the photo is the car you see in front of you. And as you look through those photos, you you see the couple who did the work of restoration, and it just brings a smile to their face to show off this amazing piece of work that they've done. Okay, Good works are so much like that in your life as a child of God. We don't do good works to earn extra credit with God. Okay, We do good works so that God can show off His grace to the world. He wants to hold us up as His workmanship that He has restored. And when that happens, your good works make God smile. Another thing I'll say about good works. Your good works are actually God's good works. When you are kind to another person because the grace of God lives in you and and you just feel in your heart, God wants me to be kind to this person. Let me tell you what's really going on there. The grace of God has touched you. It's made a difference in your heart. And now God is channeling His grace through you to touch that other person. Your good work was actually His good work. All the good that we could ever do, it comes from the goodness of of our God working inside of us. We don't take credit for salvation. Nope. Jesus paid for that. And in a really similar way, we don't take credit for our good works. Not the ones done in faith. Okay, if you do it in your own power, that's not the way that that's supposed to work. We let God do the work in us. There is no room for a big head in the Christian's life. And let me tell you, if you do belong to Jesus... He is a good father to you. And he will humble you if you get the big head in your walk with him, as a good father should. You know, we've been watching a lot of the Olympics at, uh, at our house. I think the Olympics are amazing. I mean, there's so many awesome stories. Um, what I'm most amused by, though, is my family and I can just have this incredibly busy day, and at the end of the day, we turn on the Olympics, and, and, and just instantly, we're, we're transformed. And I see these athletes who I've never heard of, many of them, right, do, doing a sport I know nothing about, but if they've got USA across their chest, we're their biggest fans, you know, for about five minutes until it's over, and then we never really think about it again. But we've been watching a, a, a lot of Olympics. Well, a um, hundred years ago, The Olympics were held in Paris, just like they're being held now, 1924. 
And during that year, there was an Olympic sprinter from Scotland. He was running for England who won gold in the 400 meters. His name was Eric Liddell. He, he was really, really made known. In the 1980s, there was a major motion picture on his life called Chariots of Fire. Listen to what he was quoted as saying in that movie. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I can feel his pleasure in my life. When you and I do good works, when there's victory in our life, when God uses us to touch other people, let me tell you, we are doing what we were destined to do. And that's the third thing I want to say about good works. Good works are your destiny. And I don't say that lightly. God made you to do good works. Your good works don't earn anything, okay? But he made you for them. A Christian not living in good, in good works is, is like a majestic creature living in a cage. It's not how we were intended to live. Notice what Ephesians 2.10 says, We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. We are saved by grace. Remember that. Take it with you today. We are set apart for good works. That's equipment you're going to need. Let me share with you a final reality this morning about your life as a Christian. You are to share the gospel. These are part of the equipment we need to serve Christ well. We are to share the gospel. Notice with me in Ephesians 3. If you have your Bibles this morning, just skip ahead to chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 8, 9, and 10 there. Here, Paul is going to really describe his ministry as a missionary, as an apostle, as a man that was just completely on fire for telling others about Jesus. He says there in Ephesians 3, verse 8, This grace was given to me, the least of all the saints. And what was that grace? That I would proclaim to the Gentiles the incalculable riches of Christ. That I would, verse 9 says, shed light for all about the administration of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This is so that God's multifaceted wisdom may now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavens. So I just want to point out a few things that Paul really emphasized there. He's, he's autobiographical in, in these verses, talking about his great passion to tell others about Jesus Christ. But in verse 8, he says, hey, let me tell you why I'm here. To proclaim the riches of Christ. In verse number 9, he says it a different way. To shed light about the mystery of Christ. And he says it again in verse 10. Just boom, boom, boom. To make known Christ through the church. Right? That, was, that was what Paul was all about. And, and it's no coincidence that his impulse to share Christ with others follows right on the heels of him describing for us that we are saved by grace and that we are set apart for good works. Okay, This third reality is really important to who we are as Christians. We are to share the gospel. So let me ask two questions about the gospel as we wrap up our time of preaching together. Number one, what is the gospel? And number two, how do we share it? What is the gospel and how do we share? What's the gospel? It's so simple. Jesus loves you and he died on the cross to pay for your sins. Repent and trust him. That's the gospel. We could, we could say it in a hundred different ways and it would all ultimately mean the same thing. But in a nutshell, this is the gospel message. Friend, you're a sinner, but Jesus loves you. And so he's done something about your sin. He died on the cross to pay for your sin. Repent and trust in Christ. That's the gospel. So how do you share that? Very quickly, three ways. Number one, you share your story. Right? The story of how Jesus has made a difference in your life. Every story that God writes is an incredible story. Know your story and share your story. Number two, how do you share the gospel? You share your prayers. 
Let me, let me tell you one little thing you can add to your life as a Christian that I promise will make a difference. Pray for a lost person by name regularly. We all know people in our life. Hey, Judgment-free zone? <laughs> Who are we to judge, right? We're sinners. We're sinners too. But we all know people in our life, and if we had to guess, we'd say, I don't think they know the Lord. I, I don't think that they've given their heart to Jesus. All right, pray for that person regularly. Share your prayers. And then finally, share your life. Share your life. Get to know people outside of your church circle. We, we have a wonderful church um, here in a community the size of Rinkin. It would be considered a big church. We have lots of different programs and activities. And if you're not careful, most of your social life could happen all within the walls of our church and our programming. I'm telling you to get out of that a little bit and get to know lost people. Share your story, your prayers, and share your life with them. And if you struggle with sharing the gospel, right? You hear about grace, you hear about good works, and you're like, yep, yep, preach it. And then we get to the sharing the gospel part, and you're like, ooh, I, I'm not real great at that, or, or I'm not real comfortable with that sort of thing. Let me just say this. You can't share what you don't have. And so if you never share Christ with people, you need to ask some important questions about what it is that you really have. And you won't share what you're not excited about, right? We share the things that we're excited about. We can't help ourselves. Maybe you're into um, guitars, right? I, I, was talking with, I was talking with David before the service about the guitar he was using. I'm into guitars. I think they're incredible. I love to read a rock and roll biography about great guitar. I'm reading a biography about Van Halen right now. I'm just interested in that stuff. So, David, you know, I wasn't trying to uh, uh, proselytize you at all. I talk with you about guitars because they're cool and they excite me, right? We talk about the things we're excited about. If Jesus is working in your life, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have an opportunity to share what you're excited about with other people, and you should. And I think the secret sauce that's missing from a lot of Christians' lives is that we don't tell others about Jesus. And if we would, we would find this dynamic power that's really been missing. You say, well, I, you know, I don't have my act together. I, I don't think I can share. That's not how it works. If we all had to have our act together to share, we wouldn't tell anybody, because let's be honest, we all got things we need to work on. Oh, well, I just don't know enough. It's not your knowledge that saves anybody anyways. Man, just tell them, Jesus made a difference in my life. And they say, well, what do you mean? I'm not really sure, but I know he did. Just get it out. Okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. You do have to get it out. If you can just be the witness, God can use that in some incredible ways in your life. So remember these three things. They are equipment you need so that you don't drive home in the middle of the night because you didn't bring the right sleeping bag, okay? You're saved by grace. Never grow past that. You're saved by grace. You're set apart for good works. And you're to share the gospel. Let me invite you, if you would, to bow your heads with me. Now, while your heads are bowed, uh, I want to give a couple of instructions because we're actually going to close our service this morning by observing the Lord's Supper. And so with your heads bowed, I just want to give you an opportunity today to do any heart business you need to do with your Heavenly Father before we participate together in the Lord's Supper. However God has touched your heart this morning, whatever He's been doing in your life this week, would you just surrender to Him now? Say, yes, Jesus, I will serve you. I will serve you. If you have any sin in your heart and it's just nagging at your conscience and you say, you know, I did this thing and, and I've never really owned up to that. Now's the time. Say, Jesus, I know you love me. Will you please forgive me of my sin? I trust you. Father, as we prepare our hearts to partake of the Lord's Supper together. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would touch this room with your presence and power. And Lord, may, may this eating and drinking show just how much we need you 
and how much we trust you. Be present with us, Lord, as we participate together. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time.